Boa tarde. Uh, meu nome é... Ada, bom dia. Boa tarde. Bom dia, desculpa, estamos agora enganada. O meu nome é Mário Borges e a senhora aqui é o meu pai, o Manuel Borges. A gente somos um neighborhood and neighborhood restaurant and bakery. Temos um padaria e restaurante. A gente aqui é tipo cozinha portuguesa. This is my partner. We, uh, we've been in business, me and my father, about two years now. And uh, he helps me out. He's, you know, comes in, helps us out. So, uh, I understand you were a cook also your whole life. <laughs> All my life. Yes, right. And your father also? No, my father I've never worked in the kitchen. So me, yes, I got a 14 years, 15 years when I go for the kitchen. I got a 66 now. I have enough. We use one secret ingredient on it. And we do all the bacon right here. All our bread. We also make a wheat, a white, and we also make a sweet. Okay, this is one of our specials today. It's banana pancakes with apple, and it's waffles, and it's with sausage, link sausage, whole fries. This is another one of our specials. It's a vegetable omelet, and it's carrots, fresh peas, uh, cheese, and tomato, fresh vegetables. That's the finished product. This is our vegetable omelet. This is our waffles with the sausage. No, it's not yours, Jackie. Is mine? No. How did you get interested in cooking? One day, I, I, when I first Yeah. Oh, when I had a 14 years old. Yeah. Portugal. I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming for this country. I have a 38 years old in New Jersey. I have a business in New Jersey, a lot of here. So I moved from here. I don't know why. Mary, how long has this restaurant been open? been in business I started about four years ago and hopefully I'm still going you know a lot of hard work behind it like everything else but I think when you're on a small business I think it drains you because it's like being married you know because it takes so much from you and it doesn't give you that much, you know? People think that you're in business, they think you're making a fortune. It's, that's not true, you know? But you must like it, don't I mean, you think? Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm pretty sure Pier 4, Anthony is making a fortune, you know, places like that. But when a small little business like myself, where it's a family business, you make enough to pay your bills and take a salary. The only satisfaction that you got is that I see it growing year by year, and I, it's like a baby growing up. You know, you get the satisfaction of seeing them walk, talk, and so on. Same thing here with the business. I don't know if that sounds weird to you, but that's my philosophy on the business. But doesn't it make you happy to see customers who like your food? And well, of course, you get a satisfaction of knowing that they like your food, and you know they come down, they greet you, and they know you and everything. This is our white family loaf, we like to call it. This is basically the same thing as the square one, but this is the, a lot of people like the round one because it's, it's got a different texture. I can't explain how, but it does. Mario, you gonna have some uh, wheat toast? Coming out, Claude. This gentleman here is Claude. He's, he's one of our waitresses, works on weekends and other days. I have basically two waiters, this gentleman and a young lady upstairs, Jack. You'll meet her in a little while. Can I have some toast with that? Wheat toast? Yes. Okay. It's coming just right up. One, one, one order? Yeah. Okay, Claude, well, just come back right down, bring this upstairs, please. Yeah, we uh, last week we were here and it was like elbow to elbow. Really? Yeah. So when you look at the same way you like it. It's great and, and it's cheap. It's right around the corner. It's <laughs> <laughs> Mario? Yes. Yeah, I want one number eight mm -hmm. and one beside one of the pizza. Okay, this young lady here is Jackie. She's one of our waitresses. Um, she works also with us on weekends. 
a very nice person, but I'm a little hard to handle. Would you take that up to court with that wheat toast? Well, yep. come down and get the breath with. This is our lunch that we're making up right now. Here we have the feijoada, it's the black beans. It's called feijoada, it's all pork, all different kinds of pieces of pork. And that's served with uh, white rice, black beans, and all that combination, and collard greens on top. And a special sauce, that's excellent. It's called feijoada, that's a Brazilian, traditional Brazilian dish. And we also have the uh, chicken fr uh, beef fricassee here. And then on that part there, we're cooking rap cacciatore. So we, we vary. We have like a little bit of Italian, a little bit of Brazilian, Portuguese, and a little bit of American. Once in a while, we make a meatloaf, basic. But basically, it's most European food. And it's over here. There's dried meat, pork. Uh, pork feet, Portuguese chorizo, and the beans, red, that's over here. It's the beans. It's the meat, I mix when the people make the dish. When I make the dish at upstairs, I put this, this in the top, this, uh, the meat. A lot of meat I have here. Dry and pork, uh, salt and flesh meat, and pork feet, chorizo, salsicha, Portuguese salsicha. So it said uh, the Brazil people love this, that the Brazil people love this plate. Um, the Portuguese eat too and like. Mm -hmm. And the American people came in, some like, some don't like because it's beans, you know. It's got a nice taste. What do you do with the lobsters? I have a three or four kinds. Uh -huh. Roll and boil and uh, stuff, lobster and, uh, uh, lobster and green sauce, lobster and garlic sauce. Got a lot of, it's fresh and good, I'm gonna think. See, it's got the light. Portuguese chame, caçadora, Portuguese, coelha caçadora. Caçadora, <laughs> it's simple. Arranco, manteiga, arroz de manteiga, se chame em português. Aqui são vegetais pesquinhos e ervilhas com cenouras. Para a guarnição do coelho, bifes, tudo que a gente cá faz. Temos as nossas guarnições. Uh, sardinhas à portuguesa, assadas, com batatas cozidas, saladas de pimentos. Uh, tudo à portuguesa, americana, alguma coisa à francesa, que se pode fazer. Here, what are my favorite dish? Yeah. Portuguese sardines on the grill. Oh, the, here they serve that. And uh, they call uh, the soup called bread. It's delicious. And the rice is very good too. That was delicious. It's very delicious. This is excellent cod. This is the best cod I've found yet. Uh, we make it boil and we charcoal. But um, normally a lot of people like it charcoal. Mm -hmm. Green peppers and a nice salad, boiled potatoes. It's an excellent plate. Bacalhau portuguesa. Os portugueses gostam muito deste bacalhau. Bacalhau norueguês, do melhor que há. Isto agora, agora, agora que estava a dizer, estava a dizer a logo a minha avó. Isidora de Medeiros Raposo. Isidora de Medeiros Raposo, um grande abraço, vó, e um grande beijo. Seu neto Mário. Seu neto Mário, e a avó agora se calhar está em fonte de talaveja vendo isso. E a gente vai continuar sempre. Nós, uh, por favor, não esqueçam que a gente faz batizados, casamentos, chaves, a gente faz o que é preciso. A gente temos aqui espaço para 40, 45 pessoas. E tanto lá fora nos clubes. E faz, a gente faz nos clubes também. A gente já fizemos no Félix, nos clubes aí. Então, se quiser mais informação, o nosso telefone é 625 8306 e 623-9710. Pode, pode chamar qualquer número, a gente atende qualquer número. Muito e obrigado. Muito Deus. obrigado pela sua atenção e um dia feliz. Uhum. <risos>
to everybody in Somerville, please stop in and say hi to us. Uh, I think if you try our product, I think you'll enjoy it. We have a nice product at a reasonable price. Please stop in and say hi to Mario. Jackie? Yes? I need you for a minute, Jackie. A hundred? And this is 99. Do you want me to give you 99? No, a hundred. A hundred. So that's the yeah, black. How did you first start creating kinetic sculptures? Um, actually, the first piece that I created was um, in 1981. Um, in when I was in school um, in uh, late 70s, I had done some dance performances that um, involved kinetic objects with dancers. Uh, and the sculpture that I was making in school, I, I, um, I always wanted it to, I always felt as if I wanted it to be animated, and I never, but I never really achieved it, uh, or never really attempted to make real kinetic sculpture at that time. Um, but um, in 1981, um, I moved to the Boston area and I began to do uh, drawings of um, the Charles River and uh, the landscape around it. And I've, I've always really been intrigued by the natural world and the things in the natural world, trees and animals and people uh, and just, you know, the earth itself and uh, kind of natural sciences uh, type things. and. Um, also, I've always been intrigued with machines and mechanical kinds of contraptions. And uh, one of the things that I think is very special about the uh, landscape along the Charles River is this juxtaposition of the natural world, you know, the trees and the river uh, and the hills and the, the city, the landscape, and uh, the city and the buildings, the architecture as well as the uh, sailboats, which are really, they're very simple wind machines. Uh, and that, that combination just has a very special beauty to it that uh, I'm very drawn to. Uh, and I was doing, at that time, I was doing a series of watercolors um, in charcoal drawings of that area. And I thought that it would be very interesting to create some kind of a kinetic sculpture that was a landscape and captured some of that feeling of the movement and um, the light and colors and uh, textures. And I created a piece called the Solar Sailboat Race. Um, initially that piece, as I was conceiving of it, it was um, going to be motorized and sailboats and it, th there just was, there was something missing there. There was some connection that was missing and then it occurred to me that if I made it solar powered, if I made it run with the energy from the sun, that uh, that would really tie the sculpture in with this whole natural, you know, vista uh, in a very special way. Uh, in sailboats, are, they're wind machines, but the wind comes from the sun and the same wind, the same sun that makes the wind that makes real sailboats move makes the sailboats in my solar uh, sailboat race sculptures move also. Is that when you started using photovoltaic cells in your sculptures? Uh, yes, that's the first time that it really, uh, that it dawned on me that I could do this and that it, it made sense to do this and, um... Greg, tell us about your experiences at the Shady Hill Preschool. We worked with those children designing that solar caterpillar. In 1987, I was invited to be an artist in residence at uh, Shady Hill School in Cambridge, which is, and I worked with preschool and first graders. Um, the idea was to share my art with them uh, for a week and to create a sculpture with them. And um, I shared with them the idea of the solar sculptures that I make as, uh, and uh, Remarkably, they re they fully understood, uh, you know, what it was that I was doing and what the notion um, that I had in mind in creating them, um, in many ways better than adults did. And um, I created a piece with them uh, that they aptly titled um, 
solar peed. It's, it's sort of a sort of a caterpillar, sort of an insect kind of a form, and uh, the children made the heads and hands and and um, tail and and kind of helped me design the ultimate, the final form that it um, manifests itself as. But uh, the fun thing about that is that it's a creature, it's an animal that, uh, again, runs with sunlight and moves along. And um, the, children the children really got the notion of uh, the connection between the, you know, the solar energy and, and, and an insect that you know, feeds off of plants that get their energy uh, from the sun. And uh, my, the week that I spent there, in many ways, I felt was kind of a process of planting seeds uh, you know, in the minds of these, you know, children, so that maybe in the, when they grow up to be adults, they will think about, you know, things, think about their relationship uh, to the, you know, natural world. What do you see uh, your work going towards in the future? Uh, do you see yourself uh, doing anything different or uh, perhaps doing the same thing? Or um, I see myself doing more of the same. Um, but I would like to get my work more out in the public. I'd like to do uh, some larger pieces, uh, you know, that would become part, more a part of the public domain. Um, because I think it's important that people be reminded on a more daily basis that uh, their air-conditioned office isn't the focus of the of the world. Uh, that you know. There are trees and plants, and uh, there's a lot of pleasure to be derived from them, and that they're also very vital, that they're very vital. Uh, and um, so I think that that's kind of the direction that I see myself moving in. This is water lily, and it's a floating sculpture. The green part down here is the float. Um, the water, when it floats in the water, the water comes up to about here, this level right here. Um, these are the petals, which are very slowly closing right now. Um, it takes about six minutes for it to completely open and close. It cycles perpetually. Uh, on the top here, this is the uh, solar panels, and this is what collects the sunlight energy. At the very top, right here, this is the solar panel that collects the uh, sun's energy, uh, although right now we have it running on a spotlight. And that makes the, uh, the inside this uh, box here is a, um, is a motor, a special kind of motor, that makes the uh, mechanism work. Um, and you can see there are components that connect parts of the flowers, the pestles, stamens, etc., that connect the uh, leaves up to the solar cells. Um, down below in the bottom are that uh, floats below the water, when the uh, sculpture is in a pond, you don't see this, are uh, counterweights. And uh, these counterweights uh, counterweight the petals and allow them to close more easily. Uh, without needing an awful lot of sunlight for the sculpture to work.